Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the New York Film Academy's Guest Speaker Forum. Tonight is what I hope will be a continuing series of programs in which we engage in conversations with professionals in the entertainment industry. My name is Adam Nimoy. I'll be your moderator for the next hour. I'm happy to be back here at the New York Film Academy, where I taught filmmaking for many years. The purpose of this program is to give you, the viewers, an inside look at the inner workings of the entertainment industry, particularly now in these challenging times where COVID has had such a huge impact on television and motion picture production. On tonight's program, we have two distinguished guests and I will be talking with them for about 45 minutes, after which we'll take questions from you, the audience. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to type in any questions and we will try to get to as many of them as we can with time permitting. Now tonight, we are very fortunate to have two guests who are working on the front lines of television production. Liz Miller is Vice President of Production at Paramount Television Studios. Liz and her team are responsible for overseeing production companies who are creating content or series episodes for streaming platforms, which you have all been watching during this pandemic. In this respect, Liz oversees budgets, she monitors production practices. She works closely with other departments at the Paramount Television Studios, including the creative programming department, finance and post-production services, all to ensure efficient delivery of each program from script to streaming. Say that five times, script to streaming. Liz has previously served as director of production at Netflix and was senior VP of production at the CBS Television Studios. She received her bachelor's degree in broadcast communications at the University of Hawaii. Liz, if you want to turn on your camera and wave to us so we can see you and say hello. Hi, Liz, thank you for coming. Hello. Okay. Hello, also with us tonight is Madeline Nimoy. Maddie works under Liz as the director of production at Paramount Television Studios. She is responsible for setting up productions all over the world and also works with Paramount TV's creative department, the finance department, the business affairs department and post-production services. Maddie manages shows from script to delivery to ensure that those shows come in on time and on budget. Prior to her six years at Paramount, Maddie worked in production on Person of Interest and Masters of Sex. She has a degree in art history and photography from Bard College. And a little disclosure here, I have to say that I have known Maddie for several years as she happens to be my daughter. <laughs> Between the two, Maddie, you want to come on and wave and say hello? Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming. I want to say before you, uh, we start getting into the conversation that between the two of you, you have uh, Maddie and Liz have overseen production uh, in charge of shows such as 13 Reasons Why, Station Eleven, Made for Love, Jack Ryan, and the highly anticipated show The Offer, which will be streaming in March and is all about the making of Francis Ford Coppola's classic film, The Godfather. Is that correct, Maddie? It's gonna start in March, is that right? April 28th, April, April 28th. April 28th, you got it. Okay, you heard it here. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I wanna start off this evening. Uh, my first question will be to Liz, will be to both of you, but one of the things I wanted to start off with is having taught at the New York Film Academy for many years, uh, a lot of my students had one question in mind, always predominantly in mind, and that is how to break into the entertainment industry. So Liz, if you would begin by telling us how you made your way into the industry and how you find yourself into such an incredibly important position at Paramount Television Studios. I'm so glad you think it's so important. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for taking time and um, coming to this event. This is great. Um, I, I've known Maddie for so long. I've just met her father. It's great. Um, so how did I get into this business? It is, it's, it was so strange and I will try to keep it as short as possible because I can go on forever on this. So basically this was about 30 years ago. I um, didn't know what I really wanted to do. So I dropped out of um, college. I was I went to the University of Hawaii for two years and just dropped out. I started doing you know just odd jobs, and then I thought, okay, you know what? I need to 
go get a job, a real job, and I need a college degree. So I just, I had no idea what to do. And I came to the conclusion that the easiest um, major was communications and broadcast, broadcast communication. So I, I went back to school for two years and then I got an internship at Ogilvy and Mather just before I graduated um, college. Um, I went into the broadcast department and um, I worked there until I graduated. They hired me on. I did a couple commercials there, produced it, and then decided I just wanted to go out in the field because I was working with a lot of producers who um, had uh, shows starting up in Hawaii, in Honolulu. That's where I grew up. And so that's really how I started and get into the business. It was just super random. It's not like I wanted to go into production, but I kind of fell into it. And it was, you know, it, back then it paid a lot of money and it was just it's really cool. And it actually got me out of um, the islands. It just, it gave me a reason to leave. So, oh God, I don't know, um, in the late eighties, is um, I left with a show. Um, I packed up my Honda and all the boxes in these mats and containers that shipped all my stuff to California and Los Angeles and actually started my career. That's how it was. Where, I mean, I could go how, on. How did you, well, how did you get into, uh, you were uh, in production at Netflix and then you were at the CBS television studio. How did that all happen? Oh, so yeah, so, uh, that was later on, but yeah, I, I then I was I, I I worked on in production on the ground, and then I decided I wanted to get into the corporate side just for personal reasons, you know, and uh, because it was more stable. Actually, that was the the main reason, and so I started uh, being a uh, an assistant to the head of production, which I really think that that's a good way into the corporate structure. And, um, and I think Maddie was that too. I think Maddie was, uh, right. That's what you did too. So, so it is, it is a viable solution to get into, uh, management where I am and Maddie is. So, um, I, I, I did that for a lot of years and then, um, and that was at Paramount, actually Paramount studios, like a long time ago. And then, um, CBS came in, they, they, they took Paramount. We went to uh, Studio City, where um, there's a, a, a CBS Studios there. I worked there for uh, 15 years and rose up from being a manager to um, a production executive to VP to senior VP. And then I was, you know, the Netflix was like the big thing in town, right? Everybody was being uh, poached and it was the thing to do. And it was the bright and shiny, um, you know, new streamer, very popular. And um, they, they courted me for several years. And finally I said, hell with it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna bite the bullet and leave. And I did. And it was, it was a interesting um, place to work. I'm sure, I'm sure you guys have read all kind of news about Netflix. It's all true. Um, I was, I was just one of them who just didn't last. It was just not for me. Um, but then I landed back at Paramount. It's, it's like a full circle. So that's kind of like where I am. And then now, and then um, I started here as, like three years ago as a senior vice president. And now I'm an executive, just recently, executive vice president. So, and then I'm here. <laughs> I did all of that in like, I don't know, 10 minutes. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> Maddie, why don't you tell us your experience coming out of Bard College? How, how did it work? Um, yeah, I, I also, uh, you know, had visited a set a couple times um, in my childhood and was, I was always fascinated by the behind the scenes. Like I was always very obsessed with all the pieces that went into a production, you know, from production design to the wardrobe, to the props, to the set dressing. Um, I just couldn't believe how much work it was to, to get a TV show made. So when I was in my senior year of college, I started day playing on person of interest. I was going to school in upstate New York and I would drive into 
New York City to day play like once a week because I wanted to get my foot in the door. And I was hoping they what would hire me. What does that mean, day play? Like, what does that mean? That's like I would work a day here, a day there. I would, I would, they would ask me to come in on a Tuesday and I would come be an office PA and miss school for the day because I was hoping to set myself up. Um, again, you know, it always helps to, you know, know one random person who could connect you with another random person. And that's kind of the nature of how a lot of people get jobs in this industry. Um, but what was great about it is I remember I graduated college, I went came back home to Los Angeles for about two weeks. And then I got the call. Okay, yeah, we'll hire you for season two. So I flew back. Um, I remember the production coordinator said to me on my first day of work, basically like we're giving you a chance. And if you screw up, I'm going to fire you, which were really nice words on day <laughs> one of your job. <laughs> um, but the thing that's interesting about it is you know, the show was really hard. It was, I mean, Liz, you were at CBS, probably knew one of the execs overseeing it at the time. I mean, it was a 22 episode show. So we went- I remember for, it. Yeah, we went for a whole year and I was the only office PA that survived the whole season because people just quit and dropped like flies because it was so hard. I mean, really mm -hmm. so taxing and challenging. I actually think it's literally to this day, the hardest job I've ever had, just because of the sheer amount of hours worked. And, you know, you just have to do the most random stuff, you know, you're, whether it's getting coffee for the producers or you're driving people to the train station in New York, you know, or you're making sides, which are, you know, the little half pages that everybody uses on set on the day of what scenes we're shooting at four in the morning, you know, after you've gone to bed at 1am. I mean, it was a wild experience, but it definitely shaped me forever. And the best part about it is that I still am in touch with all of the people I met on that show. So that's been kind of an incredible thing for me. You know, you just yeah, never know who you're gonna meet. I wanna mention a couple of things. Number one that, and we talked about this, the fact of the matter is you did get on that show through JJ Abrams, through Leonard Nimoy, who you happen to be related to. Um, but the fact of the matter is you proved yourself on that show. I mean. There is nepotism in the industry. You do have to have connections. It's very helpful. But if you don't show up and do the work, you're going to be gone very quickly. And clearly, you were one of the last men standing at Person of Interest. A very difficult show because you're out most of the production a week. You're out on the street, uh, which is extremely demanding for any production to not have the safety and the comfort of being on a soundstage for most of the week. So you went from uh, Person of Interest, and you made your way to Masters of Sex. And then you, and then where did you go? How, I mean, well, how, actually do you, what how do you happened, start to move around? Yeah, I mean, actually what happened after that is I, um, I mean, I got a lot of cool opportunities on person of interest again, because I was the only one hanging around. I got to actually like assist Jonah Nolan on his directorial debut. He directed his first episode of television and I was his assistant. And that was such an incredible experience. And then I was really considering staying on, but I, I kind of wanted to move back home to LA. Working in New York um, in the freezing cold in the eight, you know, 18 hour days, it's challenging for sure. Um, so I moved back to Los Angeles and then I sort of started just producing some stuff in the independent world, like really low budget, small stuff, just to get other experience and my feet wet in that regard. But the independent world is just tricky, you know, because there's no rules, there's no regulations. Safety is not a top priority, unfortunately, on some of the things I worked on. And I just, I didn't feel great about it after a couple of years. I mean, I wouldn't exchange those experiences for the world. I did a pilot for David Mamet that was cost $100,000. I did a horror movie for Joe Schmo, that was $200,000, but it was great because I was managing, learning how to manage money. Um, the thing that happened next for me is, again, through a friend, actually a family friend, I was introduced to a line producer, Matthew Carlisle, who has produced the show The Mentalist for eight seasons. And we just had a conversation and totally hit it off one day. Um, he didn't have a job for me at the time. He called me about a year later and said, I'm going to produce Masters of Sex. My assistant's moving on. Do you want to come do it with me? And I just jumped on that bandwagon. And it was really Matthew that ended up totally changing my life because he brought me to Paramount. He got the job as head of production at Paramount 
took me kicking and screaming to the corporate side because I thought I wanted to be in the field more and become a lime producer. But he just said, you know, come try it out with me. Um, I did. He was my boss for, um, I mean, I worked for him for like five years in total, but at Paramount, he was at Paramount for about three years. He was let go. There were some regime changes. And so, the, you know, when that felt like the end of the world, because he was my mentor, new people came in, but then that's how I met Liz. So that's kind of the crazy thing, the kismet thing that I talk about with Liz all the time through that sadness of Matthew moving on and doing other things, you know, I didn't know what was going to come. And that's kind of very emblematic of, you know, the open mind you have to have being in this industry because then I found Liz. Okay. A lot of connections, a lot of seed planning, uh, a lot of personal relationships, a lot of perseverance. Uh, <laughs> because I remember some of the work you were doing on person of interest was just pure punishment. <laughs> um, and, and I, you know, I can relate to some of that it being in production uh, on set. It's just a very difficult job. So Liz, let's talk a little bit about the structure at Paramount and how shows to come to you and how you interact. Now we know Brian Robbins has been appointed the new president of the studio at Paramount Pictures, which oversees all operations. And under him would be David Nevins and Nicole Clemens who are in charge of Paramount Plus and, and, and Paramount Television overall. You're on the production side of things. There's also a creative wing to Paramount Television. So how do you interact and how do shows ultimately, do they get developed in creative and then they come to you? Uh, how do shows arrive uh, and what do you do once they come to you, once you get them? So, um, so here's the production side, here's the creative side. So yes, you mentioned Nicole Clemens, she's our president. Um, um, my boss is, John Lynch, who's the head of production, um, we we take direction from creative. Now, how does how does a show come to Paramount? You know, there's there's several ways, but 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 very typically, a writer will come and pitch a idea to a creative executive, and the the and say it's at Paramount. Paramount will say. I love that idea. Let's just keep, let's keep it all positive. I love that idea. Then um, you would make a deal with this writer. He would write, he or she would write a pilot. Now they would, they would then um, Paramount Creative will give notes, shape up the story. And then if it's, if it's good enough, they will package it to sell to a streamer. So Basically, you know, what you do you can, mean by you, packaging, Lynn? Liz? Well, package it like um, you can attach a director, you know, that that is very like Steven Spielberg, or you know, um, very high level. Or you can attach a talent too, and then you take you bundle that, and then you go to Apple and say, "I've got this great idea about this, and I've got you know." J.J. Abrams and I've got, um, you know, Adam Driver and let's go do this show. And then Apple would go, love it. Let's do 13 episodes. Or, you know what? I, I'm not so sure about this because I don't know if, if uh, the actor, I don't know if this is going to work. Let's just do a pilot or let's just, uh, let's just um, do a mini room Let's just come up with more scripts. I just, I wanna hear more about your idea. I love this first pilot, but tell me more, like give me two more scripts. Um, or they can say, let's order a full room, which is a, a, we hire all the writers and then you come up with, you know, 10 scripts and then let's go straight into production. So once the script comes to us, like say it's a pilot, that's when we have to say, okay, it's a, it's a pilot about, it's a bit, it's, it's about two people in New York, they're, um, it's a cop show, you know? So how much do you think this pilot is gonna be? And then you come up with a number and then, you know, if your company is Paramount, Paramount, um, Nicole Clemens, who's our president would say, oh, um, you know, we only have 7 million to do this. And then you kind of go back and forth and you kind of, you know, if your pilot kind of costs like 10 million, you only have seven, you kind of have to shrink it down to a $7 million pilot 
because, and that's why you have your writer, you have your exec producer, your director, everybody collaborates to get the show down to a $7 million show so we can, so we okay, can but, shoot. But who's financing it? Is it the streaming service that's gonna finance the show primarily? So it Apple would be would, or Netflix or whoever you sold it to? Yeah, so, so Paramount has P plus, so they would finance it. They have a big budget that they, you know, say they're gonna do 10 shows or whatever. And then, yeah, then it could be Apple, Amazon, um, Netflix. Okay, okay, so Ooh. Maddie, tell me, tell me what you do, you know, how do you set it up? How do you interact with all these departments to get this thing off the ground with, with uh, the business affairs, the creative department, the finance department, uh, production services? How, what's your day-to-day -day look like to get a pilot going? Well, first of all, I'm just, um, the cool thing is, you know, working on the corporate side, I'm, I'm just in the, a pro the process of transitioning from being, I was a manager for four years, which is, you're much more in the weeds with just the studio policy stuff and setting up shows from a policy standpoint. And, you know, something Liz has been mentoring me on is how to be an executive and how to run your own show. And so I'm just about to finish my first own show that I was running myself with lots of supervision. But um, so, you know, I'm still new to this in many ways, but I do feel like, you know, it's really interesting to work your way up on the studio side and start at the bottom because you really understand how it's all made, you know? And there's so many pieces that, uh, are really in there that that it takes to make a show. So I would I guess what we start with is it's as Liz said, right? We it's an idea. I mean, the thing is working at Paramount, we own a lot of IP. So we're remaking a lot of shows that were um movies in the past or were shows in the past. Like, you know, Liz is doing Grease, The Rise of the Pink Ladies right now. Um, obviously I'm about to finish as not the senior exec, but a junior exec on the offer, which is the making of the Godfather movie. It's showing it in a television series. Um, you know, we work to get budgets um, set up. We of course have to work with all the various departments at Paramount to get the budgets accurate. It usually starts with business affairs because that's all the contractuals. So it's all of the writer's deals, the script fees. Again, if we have a director attached, what is that fee? If we have an actor attached, what is that fee? Is there breakage for that actor that the network is paying for because it's some really huge actor that they want for press for their show, but that we would not necessarily have within our budget. Um, where we look at where to shoot our shows, we're always looking at tax incentive states and countries like Liz, um, has been doing Jack Ryan and I've been getting to do that with her, which I think we season three, we shot in eight countries. Um, something that actually blew my mind too about Jack Ryan is that it's the same day cost to shoot Jack Ryan and Hungry as it is to shoot Made for Love in LA, which is a half hour, much simpler show than an hour long um, action packed John Krasinski show. So, I think it's cheaper. I think it's cheaper than, than what it is in LA. It probably is. Yeah. I mean, I was, when we were talking about the numbers the other day, it blew my mind. So we're always looking about, you know. Wait, let's just clarify. You're saying a one hour drama like Jack Ryan, which is an action film with a lot of complicated effects, set effects, special effects, costs less uh, than a half an hour of Made for Love, which is produced. Just one day. day. If you're going to compare one day of Jack oh. Ryan to one day of a, of a half hour, Made for Love is a half hour show. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's and even, it's. Yeah, that's why we look for places. I mean, we, we've we looked at, you know, I mean, I think Jack Ryan, we, sh we shot in Slovakia, Hungary, um, Italy, Prague, Russia, the UK. I mean, literally all over the place just to benefit from the tax incentive. So we're always looking at places like that. We work a lot in Canada because of the exchange rate and the tax incentives there. So that's a big part of setting up the show, right? Where does the show make sense? And to Liz's point of trying to fit the show into a box, that's part of where you shoot it. You know, a lot of times we'll move shows like Station Eleven that's on HBO Max. We moved from Chicago to Toronto because it made sense in the pandemic. Um, Canada at the time was doing better than the States were. And also we could get more bang for our buck, you know, because of just shooting it in Toronto. So we look for stage space all over the place. Stage space is totally a coveted 
item. You know, they are converting warehouses into stages all the time now because there's a lack of stage space because there's so much television and movies going. Um, and then we really just, you know, the biggest thing that I've had to learn through Made for Love is working with the creative to hit our number, you know, making sure that you're not hindering the creative, making sure that we as production execs support our creatives, but also being fiscally responsible at the same time. It's a, it's a fine line you have to walk. Do you mean creative as opposed to production personnel? You're talking like above the line, you're talking about writers, producers, directors, actors. Yeah. As, as opposed to cinematographer and, and the entire crew that comes after them, right? I'm talking about, yeah, above the line, like our writers, our showrunners, our creators of the show. And then of course, working in tandem with our creative execs at Paramount who are assigned to the project. So, you know, it takes a lot to get a show off the ground. I mean, there's so many people that touch it at Paramount from legal to business affairs, to production finance, to post-production and in production. And again, like Liz, correct me if I'm wrong. I sort of feel like we culminate it all together. You know, we're sort of the center. We don't specialize in anything like production finance, but we sort of have to understand everything on a slight level. And then we rely heavily on our partners. Well, okay. what I think about production is that we are the hub. We are the hub. So we connect with casting, we connect with legal, we connect with business affairs, we connect with clearances. So anybody who needs um, information on the show, they always come to us production because they know that we are in touch also with the show because we have to oversee it in a, in a financial and um, uh, production um, wise way. And um, that's not really a word, but you know, oversee, oversee them to <laughs> shoot the episode or to shoot the show and we're responsible financially. So yeah, we, are, we, we touch every department. We are unique in that we touch every department. So how many shows, Liz, are you overseeing currently? Um, right now, I was oversee, I oversee Jack Ryan season three and season four, um, Grease that we're shooting in um, Vancouver, which is a um, 1950s, you know, it's like Grease, it's a remake um, of Grease with John Travolta. Um, and uh, I'm doing Spiderwick, which is, uh, a, a, it's a children's book. Um, we're going to be shooting that in Vancouver too. And um, I just uh, gave Maddie um, my show, which is Joe Pickett. And uh, it's, it was, it's streaming right now on Charter Spectrum. And she's, I did season one and uh, Maddie's going to be doing season two. Well, how many, how many shows do you think are at any one time now in production at Paramount Television Studios? And how do you divvy them up to the people in your department to oversee them? You know, it's sort of, um, it, it sort of comes, comes to us by what we already have already. So uh, right now my plate is full. The next show that comes in is probably gonna go to another executive. And- Are, are there other executives on your level? Um, no, but um, we, have, we have four people. We, we, we have myself, we have John Lynch, who's the um, head of production. We have myself, we've got two, um, three senior vice presidents oh. and we've got uh, Maddie as a director. And then mm -hmm. we've got um, two managers and then we have a coordinator, a couple coordinators. Okay, so-, so That is our team, that is our production team. So how many, can you give me a guesstimate of how many shows you, that whole team is overseeing at any given moment? Is there, is there a general number? Yeah, I think it's like, um, well, shows that are shooting, I don't know, it's probably like six or seven. And then, then yeah. we're, we're also prepping shows. And we're also in post. So I would right. say maybe 12, okay. you know, um, at any given time. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the big elephant in the room, which is the COVID problem. Uh, I know the, uh, that the unions and the guilds had negotiated with the, uh, the Association of Motion Picture and Television Producers to come up with the back to work agreement, which they came up with last year. And they've since extended, apparently, it, it, that agreement is good through February of this year. That agreement basically outlines all the protocols that need to be maintained for safety on the set, including the zone designations, uh, mask wearing, vaccination, uh, social distancing, quarantining, uh, uh, paid time off for sick leave. I mean, all of these issues 
are defined in this agreement. How is that? How do you work with that agreement? How is it impacting you? When do you shut shows down? I mean, what what is the big implication now that, that you have to deal with? So let's start with you, Liz, in terms of the, the problems that COVID has been, been you know, uh, well, uh, bringing up. Well, what I can do is I can give you an example. Okay. So, and it just happened this week. So on Monday, we were, we were shooting in a small room. Now, we all know that we have to, with, with COVID, we have to have social distancing and you have to wear masks and um, hand sanitations and everything. So what happened was, is that we're working in a small room. We have two camera teams in this, in this room, all the grip and electric crew, and um, obviously an actor. And um, so that is Monday. On, on Tuesday, we find out that the key grip is positive. So what that happened is that he not contact trace everybody in that room. So we wake up Tuesday morning and um, suddenly we don't have two camera teams. We don't have grip and electric. We, you know, we, we don't have enough people to shoot, uh, to work. So we shut down on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. So that, that is pretty much what COVID can do when you don't follow the protocols. So um, it knocks it, and that's, and that's what we're seeing um, over, over um, uh, the, the world right now. We've got shows shutting down because of the fact that somebody is positive and it knocks people up, meaning close contact. And our, our protocols, Viacom CBS protocols are very, very stringent where it's above, it's more stringent than the CDC, um, what the CDC says. So um, somebody's positive, it's 10 days quarantine. A close contact would be 10 days of quarantine too. Wow. So, you know, like a show like Greece, um, we've had over 70 positives and those people who are positive, who go um, go um, to quarantine, they're on our payroll. So, you know, they're home while we have to pay them and then we're hiring other people to replace them. So it's a financial um, cost too. Okay. Uh, let me I mean, you- yeah, I, one more thing, just to give you a scope, I'm spending on one of my shows at least $100,000 a week on testing, mm-hmm. on um, nurses to administer it, um, and uh, the overall, uh, the doctor, the, the, the medical facility that we need to um, ask me if we have any kind of questions on what to do. Okay, That's well, a lot. That's yeah. only on one show. Well, That's okay. only a week cost. <laughs> Yeah, that, that leads me to my next question because the uh, the, uh, the trades are reporting, I think it was Daily Variety, that that motion pictures at least have to add on 15% of their budget to deal with COVID compliant restrictions and requirements. And so what is what what's the what's the number that you think is that you have to add on to a television production budget? Well, one of my shows, 18 million. You, you added on 18 million dollars yeah. for one of the shows? So what yeah. percentage of the overall budget of the show would that be? That would be, um, I'd have to figure it out, but it's, but it's probably 15%? 10%. It's probably what? No, no, no. It's like 10%. I, I'm talking in aggregate. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's about 10 or 11%. Okay. Well, Maddie, let me ask you this. If if the production follows the protocols outlined in the, in the back to work agreement, is things usually run smoothly? Are things running smoothly and you're catching any problems right away and getting people out of zone A and you can continue with production? Does it work is what I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's been a challenge and it also runs parallel with, you know, how everybody socially is feeling about it at the time. Like, you know, I would say the example that is amazing as you know, was mind blowing for me to see and, and be on the sidelines. And as we were all doing at Paramount is when we were really starting to get shows back up and running after we shut down in March of 2020. Because, you know, we told all of our shows we'd be down, oh, two weeks, maybe, you know, it wasn't until June that we started. Word. 
started doing activities where we were having to prep all this paperwork um, to get approval from labor and safety to get anything going again. But I think our first thing up and running was Jack Ryan in Italy in October of wow. 2020. And in many ways, it was a beautiful thing to watch because people were so responsible, you know, then and really cared and wanted to get back to work and knew that this was the only way we could get back to work as if they, you know, followed all the protocols and went through all the testing. But we know so much more now than we did then. And, you know, it's it's just been a it's been a wild ride through the waves of the vaccinations and um, you know, with this latest variant, it's it's I think it's been the the most challenging experience for us because of how random it is. And even if we're following all the protocols, people still out in the world are getting sick. The one thing I will say is people are not getting sick on our shows. Our shows and our sets are typically some of the safest spaces because everybody's having to wear, you know, really strict PPE and maintain social distance and test. I mean, we're testing, you know, our zone A, which are um, our crew, cast and crew, our cast, and then our crew who are around cast when they're not wearing a mask five times a week right now. Wow. So I, I do, we do really see it work when it's actually in action. There's just, of course, you know, the one-offs and, and the randomness of all this where it tumbles. Well, and you know, on, on top of that, Maddie, is like, um, one thing that we cannot control is what people do when they leave the set. Yeah. And that's where it happens. That's where, um, you know, they can get positive. They bring it to the workplace and then suddenly contact trace, you know, half the crew. Yeah. So, and that's, and that's how you shut down. Yep. As much as we want to be, you know, safe, it just, you know, life happens. Yeah. yeah, let's talk a, a little bit. Uh, we were talking earlier about this, about the financial uh, repercussions of COVID and having to shut down, because usually you, you had uh, production insurance that would handle uh, shutdowns in certain cases, but that is no longer happening, is my understanding. You cannot get insurance for COVID and that you as the production entity have to uh, have to kind of uh, assume these costs. But you were telling me, Liz, that now you're starting to share them with the with the, with the uh, the platform, the streaming platform that's financing the the production. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, when you think about when you think about if a show it's going to do 18 million dollars of of testing of just COVID related costs. This is not even a shutdown. You 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 can't. It's not sustainable. So. Um, they are now asking us to split 50 50 or 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 put in some some form of percentage mm -hmm. i mean you know and also with on insurance the insurance companies don't have they they'll go bankrupt they they can't pay for all of the covid shutdowns anymore so the studio and and the uh and the buyer whichever streaming platform it is is they're sharing the cost they're sharing the cost okay uh, I mean, uh, not that we want to, because that wasn't the deal, but you know. Right, but you, but you're forced to, uh, obviously. Yeah. What well, can you give me, a, a, guys? Give me an idea. Of what is the average cost of an episode that you're spending now? Is there an average? I know it can be all over the map depending on your talent and where you're shooting. Exactly, and what you're shooting. So, um, I mean, my above the line on one of my shows is sixty-five million dollars. So. You know, it could range. Five million it dollars from, for, for the series or for an episode? For the series, for the whole oh, the series. series. Okay, yeah. and the series is so, that, what's the order? What's the typical order for a series now? For streamers, is about ten. Ten episodes. Ten episodes. Okay. Yeah. So I would say, um, you know, anywhere between five million an episode to twenty million an episode, wow. and it all depends on what you're doing, how much VFX stunts, who's you, who's your. Um, is it Martin Scorsese, you know, directing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's your talent? Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, what 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 are you guys doing all day? What what do you you're on Zoom all day? Are you talking to production managers? Are you reading production reports? Are you looking at call sheets? What what, what is your your Zoom? I know that Maddie's on Zoom, and, and same with you, Liz. Like twelve hours a day. What, who are you talking to, and what are you talking about? 
Maddie, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I mean, we have a ton of, you know, internal meetings. Like I, I would say that that's, that's takes up a lot of our time. We have, you know, our weekly staff meeting, we have our weekly production meeting, we have our COVID production meeting, all these general things that we check in, you know, with our teams in the various departments at Paramount Weekly. Then depending on how many shows you're on, you know, you have meetings with your shows. Um, we have check-ins with our shows typically once a week. Liz, honestly, I feel like is on Zoom with something, some producer from, you know, Jack Ryan or something because of the massive sheer size of the show every day. And it can be random, right? What comes up when it does. Right now, I think the majority of my time is spent reacting to what we're dealing with, with COVID. And the thing we always joke about is that our jobs are gonna feel so easy when this is not something that we're focused on every second of every day. Um, it's really just taking it day by day, which is production in general. You know, you're always just prepping for a new location, a new stunt, a new car crash, whatever it is. But now we have the layer of all this health and safety stuff. So, I, you know, we, we do, we read our production reports every day. I look at the call sheets, we're looking at the schedules, the budgets, but right now it's, it's a day by day COVID thing for me mostly. And when you're talking to productions, are you guys talking to showrunners? Are you talking to the unit production manager? Who, who are your eyes and ears on the ground at all these shows? Liz. Well, for for um, for me, um, a lot of times I am talking to the exec producer, right. um, but I'm definitely talking to the line producer as well. Um, I feel like most of my day, I'm a I'm a I'm a fixer. I don't know if you guys watch Ray Donovan, but you know he's a fixer. Um, <laughs> Maddie and I are fixers because productions have a lot of problems. They come to us for guidance and. Um, that's what we, that's what we do. We solve problems. We problem solve, and um, we're good listeners, and we're compassionate because we're all we're all fighting for the same goal: is to um, produce the best episode within the money given. So that's exactly my day. But also, Literally. I want to just add to Liz something that Liz has taught me especially in this time, because it's so much seriousness and so much stress, you know, with all of the, the COVID and the shutdowns and the this and the that. Liz, Liz will sometimes just say, can we just have some fun? You know, because that's also a really important part of it is we are making shows. It's really amazing to watch them come to life. And I will say that it's Liz that's generally our team cheerleader of reminding everybody that, which is the most wise knowledge, I feel like, you know, because it's really easy to forget. All right, let's go on. We're, we're at uh, almost at 45 after the hour. So I, well, let's move on to some questions that we have from our viewing audience. Uh, and uh, let me, I'm scrolling down here. There, one of the questions is, this is interesting about uh, how you define what jobs are on the corporate side versus what's in the field. Because Maddie, you were talking about being independent and on your own and and how does that work in terms of the people you're interfacing with? So, so what's a corporate job on a, on a typical television show? What's a corporate job and what is not part of corporate? You want me to explain it, Liz? Okay, I can start. So, I mean, basically on the corporate side, as Liz explained, our structure is, you know, we have two EVPs, we have SVPs, we have me and then we have so those are all sort of the execs and i'm a junior and then we have managers that manage again all the studio policy and then we have coordinators that support our executives that's um that's a corporate job on the on the show side you know it's everybody who works on the show right and that's where you have the line producer and the upm and the production supervisors and the production coordinators. And that's how a production office is sort of set up on that side. So people do get confused. And I was very confused when I started in corporate, um, when I was told I was gonna be the coordinator of production at Paramount, I was like, oh, that's so cool because I thought it meant what a POC is on the show side, but it's not exactly the same level. It's a little different. A coordinator is sort of a, you know, still an assistant in many ways, but you do, you coordinate a lot for the shows. 
on um, the production side to be a production coordinator, you know, you have to be in a union. Um, you know, you have to have experience. I mean, Liz, you did that job when you were in the field before you came in house and it's, it's a whole other thing than the inside. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to give, I'm trying to figure out a great analogy in, on the difference between production and corporate. I mean, corporate, you know, the big stigma is like suits and ties and, you know, you have a corporate, you work from nine to five and you can go home, you come back at nine to five, you know, very, very um, sort of like a system. And production, you know, you can work, you know, 10 hours, you can work 12 hours, you're in with the jeans and t-shirt, you know, you're running, getting coffee, you're, um, you know, you're going and picking up things, you're, you're driving with transportation, you're getting dirty, you're, you're getting your hands dirty. It's, um, it's quite a different job. Okay, next question. Uh, have you seen a shift or change in the way cultural diversity is being showcased, represented or taking part in film and TV productions? in upcoming projects or content. You know what, we are we are so mindful of that. And, you know, uh, we, we, like for instance, Greece, our show Greece, we have a female executive producer showrunner. A showrunner is someone who, um, who makes sure that we have all the scripts and, on time. We have a female, um, director. We've got um, a female stunt coordinator. We've got um, me on, on the production, on the corporate side that I oversee that show. We have um, a line producer, a female line producer. We have female camera ops uh, operators. So, um, you know, and our cast has everything from um, from women to, to men to, um, we have a transgender, um, we have um, young, we have young women, older, we have, we have a lot of diversity. So we are very mindful. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and, and so you have a lot, a lot of women in film, a lot of women are breaking into film, is what you're saying. In different roles, right? Yeah, like, we try to be mindful to, and what about cultural diversity? What about that? Are, are, about minority, uh, you know, integration into the industry is is that something that that you guys are cognizant of or thinking of or trying to hire uh, uh, people like that who might uh, not otherwise have a chance to get in? Yeah, right. I mean, we also use this really um, cool platform called Array, uh, and that brings in that it, it compiles. Um, you know, people from all over the world um, that gives us new resources to find great people because sort of how we started the conversation, it, you know, it's, it is, it's about connections, you know, and who you know. I mean, we did a show, Boomerang, um, created by Lena Waith, and her whole thing was, we're just going to bring in, you know, she wanted all people of color supporting behind and in front of the camera, we gave so many people chances who just completely flourished on that show. And then they were able to get another job after that. They were able to get represented, you know? So definitely diversity and inclusion is a huge thing for us. Okay, I have, a, I have several questions here regarding the whole pitching process. This one says, you mentioned writers pitching to creative executives. Do, you, do writers need to come into Paramount TV with a producer or does Paramount team, uh, team scripts that have de they've developed with a producing team? I mean, what is the pitching process? Do you need an agent? Do you need to have a producer attached or some talent attached if you're if you're new and you have a great script and you want to get it read by somebody? Do they do people have to go to the agencies? Do they have to go find independent producers? Do they have to attach talent to it before they can get to a creative executive at Paramount? You know, that's a really good question because um, there's so many ways that um, a script can can come to Paramount. So can come to any any place, but usually um, you have to be represented by an agent or um, or an attorney. And um, do you need to be attached? A lot of times, if it's a writer um, and they come in with a great pilot, um, or they come in with a great idea, let's say let's say a produce a non writing producer um, comes in with a great idea, the studio will at times 
um, go to, and figure out like what writer will be great to write this project. And so the, the studio attaches this writer to work with this non-writing producer and to come up with a great script. So, you know, a lot of times the studio will attach people to the project. Okay. Uh, let me ask you a, a side question that came up about uh, safety on the set and, uh, and the whole COVID situation. Um, the, 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 the mandating vaccinations, I, I know we spoke a little bit about this. Um, the, does the safe, the, the back to work agreement allow for mandating vaccinations and, and how's that been working? What, what's your general experience with that? Maddie, you want to take it? Sure. Yeah, um, we, it's, it's not something that is required. It's actually um, a business decision is my understanding. Uh, you know, we, we have to base it off of government and provincial requirements. Like it's impossible um, and hard to do on like a super international show, for example, because what the return to work uh, agreement identifies as a fully vaccinated person it sometimes doesn't include some of the vaccinations that are, you know, all over Europe or wherever. Um, we have successfully done it. I had a mandatory zone A vaccinated show on Made for Love, which has been great in Los Angeles. Um, we haven't been able to do it in Canada yet. Um, you know, we're left looking into tracking vaccinations more and, and to try to hire people because it's, you know, better for our shows to have people who are vaccinated just in terms of the spread of COVID right now. But um, it's really just a case by case basis. It's by each individual show. Okay. Uh, one of the other questions uh, that we have, and there's several on this actually, and uh, it, it is basically, how do you get in when you know nobody, when you don't have the, uh, 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 an easy connection? What, what is the first way uh, to try to get your foot in the door? How do you find a connection in the industry by which you can then move along and prove yourself and make new connections? I mean, both of you guys, you said, Liz, you did it through, you got a job at Ogilvy and Mather, right? Which is, uh, uh, which is Advertising. a bad agency, basically. Yeah, right. Um, I would suggest um, interning, internships. Um, every, if you go to any website, CBS, um, Netflix, they have um, in their job page, they have interns. I would, I would do some internships. I would um, contact um, groups like women in film or um, women in media or array um, just to uh, get involved. And if you want to learn to be a grip or electric, they have classes, you know, they have classes and they, they are very, very, um, their, their purpose is to get um, young people into the business. Um, what else, Maddie? Um, I think it's funny, actually, because, you know, there's some, just for people who I know how challenging it is for people who don't know anybody. I mean, there's Facebook groups you can join. Like in New York, there's local zero heroes. And mm -hmm. that's an epic Facebook group where, you know, people will need day players all the time to come onto sets, whether it's a set PA or an office PA. And if you, if you put your name in the hat, you know, you're just um, hoping that you can go do that. And then you make those connections. I mean, the thing I think to remember too is, right, how Liz started, how I started, you never know who you're going to meet. I mean, if you're living in Los Angeles, so many people work in the entertainment industry. You know, if a friend of a friend of a friend, like contact those people, look at LinkedIn. I don't think LinkedIn is, you know, a dead end. Sometimes you can find some people, sometimes you can message people like us and then something random comes up and uh, it can lead to jobs. But uh, yeah, internships is obviously a great way to start. Can I just say one thing? I, I know that, that we've got five minutes left, but I, it's so important when um, you're out there and getting a job that you are on time. I, 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 t I told my son who was a PA, if you're on time, you're late. You know, you got to be there 15 minutes before. You always say, yes, of course, I'm going to do it. Yes, I, I will do whatever it takes. 
Do you want to work an hour over? Yes, I'll work an hour over. Is there anything, you know, you never sit down. You don't look at your phone. You know, you, you're Johnny on the spot. So that's, that to me is if, if I, if I had a person working for me who was just like that, I would say that's like Maddie, Ma, you know, she is, she'll do anything. She, she's so gun ho. And um, that's what I appreciate about Maddie. And, you know, she has those skills. You were a, a PA. We, I was a PA, you know, we know, we know what it means to uh, do uh, a lot of work. And so they have to be prepared to work long hours, you know, 15, 17 hours. Uh, my son came home with blisters, you know, and I said, well, this is the business kid, you know? So that was my two minute parting <laughs> favor. No, it's true. And I think just act like nothing is beneath you. I think that's the most mm -hmm. important thing, you know, is that we work with people, you know, you just never want to have an ego. I mean, I think that's even why Liz is where you are. She is because, you know, Liz, there's no task too small. And I think the thing that I've loved and learned from Liz, and this is just such, this is just the advice I would give is, you know, you learn where to pick up where other people leave off. I remember you said that to me once, Liz, you said, I love working with you because you pick up where I leave off, you know, and it's just finding those moments because then that makes you, you know, valuable because we're all replaceable at the end of the day, but that makes you valuable at least. And, and mostly what you're talking about is that a team, we're a team. What, what I can't do, she does. And what she can't do, I do. Mm -hmm. right. You know, it's, it, we work together as a team and that, and that really is um, a big purpose of mine um, is to, to work as a team. Just like Maddie said, no, no job is you know, beneath us. Mm -hmm. Just okay. because of where I am, it doesn't mean that I can't go get coffee for someone okay. or I can't start a conference hall or I can't create a Zoom. You know, I, it's, I, who cares, you know? Yeah. Now, I want, we want to clarify here again, because we, I had a couple of questions on this. You guys are not just providing content for Paramount Plus. I mean, the offer, will go, the offer will go to Paramount Plus, but, but uh, Jack Ryan is on Amazon Prime, right? Uh, HBO has uh, Made for Love. Uh, uh, the Station 11 is HBO. Joe uh, Pickett is Charter. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, have, we have stuff for all over, all the networks. And Apple, Apple Hulu. Yep. Right. Okay, so you're working for all streaming services. You yes. are not exclusive to Paramount Plus. But but the creative team decides which, where they're going to shop these projects to. Is that correct? Yeah. They'll, they'll say, hey, um, you know, like FX is, well, not that we, we produce for FX, but, you know, there are, um, there are um, networks that, you know, just do all kind of uh, the, the, the horror genres. Um, mm -hmm. So they will go, okay, this is great for Apple, or this is great for FX, or this is would be perfect for Netflix. Mm -hmm. right. So okay. they make the decision, we don't. You don't, okay. But again, it's those streaming services that you're gonna be dealing with on, from, on a financial basis to find out what they're gonna pay, what they have to pay for that series. Do you help define with the creative department what it's gonna cost them to get that show? Yes. Okay, but the price mm -hmm. tag will be for them to produce it with you. Right. Okay, yeah, interesting. Okay, we're at the six o'clock hour. Liz and Maddie, you guys are amazing. And you're in the trenches, you're doing a great job. Uh, you, have, you have determination, you have perseverance. I admire what you're doing in the industry. You are trailblazers. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all in the audience tonight for tuning in with us. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. All right, take care. Thank I'll you for you having us. Maddie, I'll see you at home. Okay.